You know, sometimes people ask me, you know, why is law, justice, and human rights uh, have anything to do with public health? And my answer is usually everything. Um, because if you think about health, um, you think firstly about your own right to health. Uh, and the World Health Organization Constitution, United Nations treaties, constitutions of many countries around the world include the right to health, the right to a safe environment, um, sometimes the right to clean water or good food. So these are all kind of basic needs that are really critical um, for a population or an individual to be healthy. And that's the other thing about human rights. Human rights, you know, protect individual liberty, autonomy, freedom from torture, and also uh, anti-discrimination and uh, the right to, to justice. So if you think about, you know, health, the environment, food, water, justice, if you don't have dignity, justice, and health, um, it's very, very hard to lead, lead the kind of life that is vibrant and wonderful. Uh, and so what your mother told you um, is true. Uh, if you've got your health, you've got everything. It's been an inspiring evolution of human rights over the last 70 years since the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Human rights law really only becomes a focal point of global health in the aftermath of the Second World War. And drawing on the UN Charter, the Constitution of the World Health Organization, nations would come together in 1948 to declare a common standard of achievement for all people and all nations in this Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Rather than laying out an expansive human right to health, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights focuses on a standard of living adequate for health and well-being. This standard of living for health and well-being would encompass both a state obligation for medical care, but also a focus on a wide range of underlying determinants of health. As these underlying of determinants of health would be codified under international law in the aftermath of the Second World War, the Cold War would serve in many ways to hobble the expansive definition of the right to health first laid out in the Universal Declaration. With the 1966 International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, limiting the right to health to a right to the highest attainable standard of health. In the midst of the Cold War, the United States and the Soviet Union would come at the right to health with very different ideological definitions of what that right to health included. And with the right to health serving as a Soviet basis for critiques of capitalist inequalities in health, the United States would push back against an expansive definition of the right to health in this International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. And yet, after this low point in 1966, in the 1970s we see civil society, the global south, nations coming together around a more expansive vision of the right to health. As WHO would be seen to have the normative legitimacy and authority to declare these obligations, we would see in the 1978 Declaration of Alma-Ata a revitalization of the definition of health in the WHO Constitution, a programmatic implementation for realizing that right under national health policy. Although the Declaration of Alma-Ata would never become part of international law, we would see human rights thrive in the 1980s as civil society embraced a rights-based approach to health within the World Health Organization as a way to respond to the expanding HIV AIDS pandemic. With this foundation of human rights and global health, the end of the Cold War would provide an opportunity for revitalizing obligations under international law. And we would see in 2000, the UN Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights declaring in General Comment 14, an expansive vision of the right to health that encompasses a wide range of underlying determinants of health, a vision in line with the 1970s WHO Declaration of Alma-Ata, and providing a foundation for considering both individual medical care and a wide range of social, economic, and political determinants of health, laying a foundation 
under international law for advancing public health into the future. The WHO was the actual first specialized United Nations agency that was formed when the United Nations was formed. And that constitution does two major things among many others, but one is it dedicates the organization as the global health leader. Um, and it defines health very, very robustly and broadly. And then secondly, it talks about rights and, and human rights, um, and particularly the right to health. Now, WHO, to be very, very honest, has not always been a champion of human rights. Um, it's not always been WHO's fault. There have been many powerful countries that have tried to stop WHO from you know, being a human rights champion. But it is in WHO's DNA. It's in their constitution. Um, and it's critically important. So uh, things like um, the right to primary care, the right to universal health coverage are all central um, to uh, the World Health Organization. And now there's a new director general, um, Dr. Tedros, who's focusing on uh, human rights and particularly uh, celebrating the fact that WHO can return as a leader of human rights uh, as we celebrate the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So there's so much optimism and so much to look forward to WHO's leadership in human rights, but we have to hold WHO to account.